I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to, I want you to also prepare to look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139 and Genesis chapter 1. The title of my message is Hallowed Be Thy Name. And I, we have been all summer uh, at our church. I spoke this word at our church last week. And we have been all summer uh, at our church studying the names of God. The many names of God in Scripture. It is so important, so vital for us to understand the name, to know and to understand the names of God. To recognize, we need to know the names of God to recognize the truth and to refute and resist, resist falsehood. We need to know the names of God, to know them well. Uh, it is essential to find rest and, and resilience in our faith. Important to receive and renew His promises in our daily uh, realities. It's also so important for every believer to know and to cling and to hold on to God's name. For His people to know His names because they, they're so, uh, His name is demeaned, diminished, and sometimes disfigured uh, in, the, in the world we live in. It's so important to God that we have passages like uh, Isaiah chapter 52 verse 5 to 6 where God speaks and says there are su such great consequences to when entire societies don't know his name, the true nature of his names. For my people were taken, Isaiah 52, 5 and 6, for my people were taken down into Egypt, they were oppressed by the Assyrians, they have been taken captive, left in ruins by those who rule over them. Because my name is blasphemed continually every day. Therefore my people shall know. My people shall know my name in that day. They shall know that I am the Lord who speaks. Behold, it is I. It is essential for us to know his name, to recognize him, to know it is he uh, who speaks. And, and this speaks prophetically of entire generations. We look at our modern society. Entire generations have literally been taken captive. They've been taken into spiritual exile. They've been taken, uh, kidnapped uh, with false, uh, false, um, uh, kidnapped by, by ritual religions, antichrist philosophies, false worldviews, and partial or misleading degrading representations of God's name. Like you've seen in some true, uh, true stories of people that have been kidnapped and they come back and they, they don't recognize their own father. They don't recognize uh, their own family. Now the Bible has many names for God in Scripture. I'm going to read you a few names of God in Scripture. And if you're a believer, if you are walking with the Lord, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. When I, when I read these names, I want you to, say, to think and I want you to shout and say, that's my God. That's my God. Say that to the person next to you. That's my God. <laughs> Names of God in the Old Covenant, Old Testament. God Almighty. God in the highest. Lord, Master. The Lord, my banner. The Lord, my shepherd. The Lord, my healer. Now, when I mention names that have been real into your life, I want you to shout something when I'm reading these names. The great I am. The Lord is here. The Lord, my justice. The Lord, eternal. The Lord, my deliverer. The Lord, my provider. Redeemer and king. Lord of hosts. The Lord of peace. The creator and my father. Say to somebody next to you, there's more. Say that to somebody next to you. <laughs> Names of Jesus in the new covenant. Almighty, our advocate to the Father. The author and the finisher of our faith. The bread of life. The beloved son, the groom, the cornerstone, the deliverer, the good shepherd, the head of the church, the holy servant, the I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. The eternal God with us, the indescribable gift, the judge of all things, the king of kings, the lamb of God and the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lord of all, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, the Savior, the Lord, the resurrected one. He's our hope. He's our peace. He's our joy unspeakable and full of glory. He's our rock and our prophet and our high priest, our redeemer, the son of man and the son of the most high God, the supreme creator of all things, the door, the way, the word, the truth, the life. Our victory, 
our wonderful counselor, almighty God, Prince of Peace, the Alpha, the Omega, the only way to God, our soon coming King, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the only one worthy to be praised and to be shouted and to be celebrated in his house. Now, I was in France two weeks ago when the country of France made it to the semifinals in the World Cup of Soccer. I was in a hotel, in a, in a normal hotel. Everything was quiet, and all of a sudden, the hotel exploded. I actually looked out of my room. People are running out in the, in the corridors, and, they, and then when they won the finals, the whole, uh, the whole country erupted, exploded. I looked around my hotel, uh, some a fancy businessman, so sophisticated, dancing, acting, shouting. I want to stop for a second here in the house of God, and I want us to shout unto God with a shout of glory, give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for who you are in my life. Hallelujah. Thank you for who you are. Make it personal. Who you are in my life. Thank you, my Lord, my God, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Deliverer. Thank you for who you are. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. My soul exalts your name. Your people lift up your name. Your people worship your name. Your people shout your name. Worship your name. Adore your name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before you're seated, say to somebody, that's my God. Hallowed be his name. Now, in the scripture, God reveals his nature to us through his names. To fully understand the importance of God's name in scripture and in our lives, we must first grasp, grasp the significance of names uh, in ancient cultures. And in biblical times, the, the, the names were so important that very often in scripture, God himself would change someone's name to reflect what he was doing in their lives, to reflect a new reality in their lives. We see this in Abraham's life. His name in Genesis 17 was Abram, which means exalted or elevated father. It was evoking his wealth, his human success, his influence, his material success uh, in, passing in, the, in the passing and, and human realm. But God uh, changed his name to Abraham, father of a multitude, reflecting his calling to a spiritual heritage, uh, at the, an eternal and spiritual impact through his life. God, God called a man named Jacob in Genesis 32. His name literally means the conniver, the, the deceiver, the, the schemer. But he received a new name when he wrestled. After wrestling with God, God said, I'm going to call you Israel. Uh, you're going to be a prince with God. One who overcomes as a prince with God. No matter what your past, no matter what your name has been, what your family name has been, he's called you to be a son, to be a daughter, to be a prince, and a princess with God. <laughs> Say to somebody next to you, be nice to me, I'm a prince or a princess. Say to somebody next to you. Hallowed be thy name. Names are so important in scripture. God changed the name of the children of Hosea. He changed the name of Hosea's son and daughter to signify changes in, their, in his relationship with his people. Uh, in their relationship towards him. From lo ami, which meant not my people, to become ami, my people. From lo uh, ruhana, uh, to, uh, which means you've not received my mercy, to ruhama, which received, means uh, you receive, you finally receive my compassion. Uh, Peter, in, for, in John chapter 1, verse 42, now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah, but your name shall be Cephas, shall be Peter, shall be the rock. Peter, the son of. Refer, refer, referencing his past, his family background, his human limitations. Peter, the, the impulsive, the fickle. Uh, Peter, uh, the unreliable. Peter, the cho choleric, the disappointing man, the, the, the failure, the, the emotional, the fragile, the unstable one, you shall be called the rock. No matter what you have been, God can change and will change your name if you surrender to him. So the question this morning is, are you ready to discover his names that he would change yours? 
Do you feel like you've met, you know it all? Do you feel like you've exhausted all of God's name because you've been a Christian for a long time? Are you allowing him to write his name on your heart? Are you hungry and thirsty to allow him to reveal his names in your life? Because this is an ongoing a process in the desires and purposes of God. Jesus said in John 17, 26, For I have made known your name uh, to them. He's speaking to his father. I have made known your name to them, but I will declare it uh, yet again. I will reveal it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I, and I in them. He wants to reveal his name in a deeper and deeper way into, into every season, decades of your walk with him. In the Bible, the word name is a translation of the Hebrew word Shem. And in the Old Testament, in the Greek word Onama, in the New Testament, together name appears over a thousand times in Scripture. It always carries the notion, the idea of power, of responsibility, of carrying his name, of purpose, of authority. A name not only expresses the essence and the significance of what is being named, but also when in relationship and duly authorized, it, it represents the access to the promises, power, and possibility of the name. Now when God asked Moses to lead his people out of uh, bondage, he gave him a new fresh revelation of one of his name to equip him, to strengthen him. And, and, and when Moses went to the people, he said, well go to your people and say, the God of your father has sent me and they will say, what is his name? And God said to Moses, I am. We sang it this morning. The worship service preached my message this morning. It was beautiful and anointed. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell them the I am send me to you. Uh, he reminds you this morning, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you, you are carrying this morning, he is the I am. He's not the I was. He is not the I once was. He's not the I may be one day. He's not the I'm not anymore. He's not the I may be again. He's not the uh, I, I have been uh, to others or someone else or somewhere else or yesterday. No, I am for you today what you need for me to be. I am your Lord, your God. Say yes, please. Now, please listen well. The conquest in his name will be proportionate with the measure of your communion with his name. I would say it this way. Nomenclature does not equal substance. There's something funny sometimes, and if you've done this, be in peace. Be, don't send me an email. But the, sometimes parents give their children the name of somebody famous. I don't know if they think something's going to be communicated. Now, we have, a, we have a register of names in Quebec, and, and every year I look at it because it's a public register of names that have been refused, name that have been, but names that have been accepted. And, and, and I see this, parents uh, uh, with a name. Uh, for example, we have in Quebec a Michael Jordan Joseph. I, hope, I think dad wants him to be a basketball player. Or a Bill Gates Johnson, a Bono U2 Stevenson, and a Celine Dion Tremblay. Do you understand that the name alone does not produce the nature? Carrying or claiming the name does not produce character. The heritage of a name will not automatically reproduce its history. The testimony of his name yesterday does not produce guaranteed triumph today. You can say, I'm a Christian. My family was a Christian. This is my religion. This is my background. It is your communion that becomes your character, that becomes your conduct, that will give cre a credence, and it, would give, it, it will give uh, authority, and it would give a trueness, and it would give uh, value to the name of Christ over your life say yes please so it is a choice every day of our lives it is a choice it is a pursuit it is a choice every day will I in my life hallow will I honor will I represent his name or will I speak and live his name in vain that's, that's the choice. That's the, that God said every day, my name is cheap and it's reduced. It's dishonored. It's blasphemed. It's hijacked. Stolen identity of God's name. Through a, uh, so the disciples pray, uh, came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. How shall we pray? So he said in Matthew 6, 9, you know it well. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Would you say out loud with me, hallowed be your name? Agiazo in the Greek. 
Elevated be your name, set apart. Your name has to be set apart. It's from the same root, a word as holy, uh, a sanctified, to elevate to the measure of his holiness. The unique measure is uniqueness and holiness. In purity, his name is to be honored. It is to be respected. It is to be revered. It's not to be mixed up or lump. A lump, never lump God's name with anyone else. I have had the privilege of meeting presidents of nations, of speaking to general assemblies of nations, to be one-on-one -on -one with prime ministers of my, uh, our country of Canada, uh, two of our prime ministers, to pray for the prime minister. And when you meet the prime minister, the president, you don't, you don't go, hey, dude. You don't go, how you doing, buddy? How are you doing, Baba? You don't go like that with a president or a prime minister. You, you, you're, you're ascribing to the, to, to the honor to his name. Now, Exodus 27 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So now you have, you have hallowing his name, honoring his name in our lives, and you have taking the, lane, the name of the Lord is vain. Now I want to propose to you that it is a lot deeper than we have uh, uh, thought it to be. This is in the, the third commandment. This is in the list of commandments with thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery or idolatry, and thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. I want you to know that it is a lot deeper than saying God's name in vain when I hit my, I say a bad word, when I hit my thumb with a hammer. It is possible for Christians not to curse, not to use the God's name in vain in that way, but using God's name in vain is a lot deeper than that. The word means uh, vain, empty, or without meaning. It describes something as having no substance. It has to do with using God's name in a way that, that, that is inconsistent with who he is, his personality, his character, it, thus stripping him away, stripping the value that belongs to his name. When I act and, and proclaim uh, that, that I am of his name and act contrary to his name, contrary to his character, contrary uh, to his spirit, a false signature, a non-authorized use of his name to call on the privileges, benefits, and resources of a name without the relationship and true communion with the name. Now, we have a food bank next to our church that serves, uh, these, uh, serves uh, 10,000 families a month, warehouses and trucks. And, and we also have a clothing store, very nice uh, clothing store, but everything is very, very low price. Brand new uh, clothing that we, uh, re that we sell very, very cheap. It's a, it's a, very, it's a high, it's a fancy thrift uh, store for everybody to come and, and dress their whole families. And it's uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces of clothing every year. And, on, and it's open on Sunday. On Sunday afternoon, it's open to everyone. It's open to the public all week. It's open to, uh, to uh, the church also. People come out. And my daughter, who's now heading one of our programs at our church, uh, she used as a student to work as a cashier in the boutique, uh, the clothing store, after the church services on Sunday. But she would not tell people she was my daughter. And, and, and it happened more than once that some ladies would come in and they would say, oh, they would bring a whole bunch of clothes, put it on the, on the counter, and they would say, oh, it's 50% off for me. And my daughter would say, oh yeah, how come? Pastor Claude said so. <laughs> so she would say, really, Pastor Claude? He said that to you personally. Really? Some of you look shocked right now. I know people, ladies coming out of church lying to get free clothes. I know, this is great. <laughs> this, uh, say to somebody next to you, this would only happen in Montreal, never in New York City. <laughs> You see, she was, she was using my name without their relationship, without the communion, without the authority. Psalm 86, 11 says, teach me your ways, O Lord, and I will walk in truth and unite my heart to honor your name. What a prayer to say, Lord, bring my heart to a place of never living it in vain, speaking it in vain, or causing it to be vain in someone's life because of my testimony. I want my life to hollow your name. I want my testimony my words, my family. I want my commitments. I want the truth, the joy. I want my, my trueness and my character to hallow your name. Hallowed be your name in my life. So we look at one name of God this morning. Hallowed be thy name. We'll do a little, the we'll look at the first name of God that appears in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim. Elohim, you need to learn this. We're going to do a little theology 
this morning. It's not boring. Theology is not boring. Theology is not for the elite. Theology is not for arrogance or condescendence. Theology is certainly not separate. In some circles, they think this is a life of the Spirit. This is theology. It's dry. No, no, no. Theology is theos logos. It's speaking about God to learn of him, to know him, to experience him. For the people that will know their God shall do exploits. Say yes, please. So we learn together the name of God, Elohim, and we learn that Elohim is preeminent. A little theology. He is transcendent. He's preeminent. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. 35 times at the start of scripture, the only uh, name used for God from Genesis 1, 1 to Genesis 2, 3 is Elohim. Other names come later with what we call through the scripture, the progressive revelation. But, but first impressions are so important and God introduces himself uh, to creation as Elohim, the transcendent creator. He's preeminent. He's transcendent over his creation. He transcends his creation. Why is so important? He wants us to, re, to recognize that he is distinct from creation. God is not amalgamated with his creation. He transcends his creation. He's not a river. He's not a moon. He's not a tree. He's not a sun. He's not a rock. He's not a butterfly or an animal or any other created thing. He alone, he is uh, the creator alone. Elohim, the powerful, all-powerful creator, unique in his worthiness to be praised and worshipped. Now, he, he transcends his creation is very important because we notice that religions and philosophies that worship and create, that worship created things, they will worship animals, they will worship uh, a tree, they will worship uh, animism and, and polytheism and, and Hinduism, for example, make, make uh, oftentimes they make uh, mu multiplying gods and using and, and, and elevating uh, other th things in him to the, to the, to the place of godship. They always have a low respect and no, a low acknowledgement of the value of human life. When I was in India, you, you, you understand of, with the, the worship, for example, of sacred cows. And this, you, you see this, how I filmed this, where everything stops. And, and, and at the same time, you have the, the, the hundreds of millions of children in famine. And in, uh, when I was in uh, Nepal, Kathmandu, Nepal. I happened to be there today, one of the poorest country in the world. Uh, uh, hundreds and, th and thousands of villages with no water, no electricity, children living in the hor horrific conditions. Uh, and, and, and I was in, in, a, in the main city of Kathmandu and actually I took pictures of this. It happened to be a dog, uh, a dog worship day. And they, uh, they elevate and worship the dog. And actually a lot of people had put, uh, they saved money all year and they put uh, uh, necklaces with pearls around the dog's necks and walk their dogs down the, down the road that thinking it's going to bring something to them. Christianity, when it is truly preached, honors God as creator and life as sacred. Life in the womb, life outside of the womb creation. Uh, and Because every human being is created in God's image. No matter where he is in the world, no matter the color of their skin, no matter what regime they're under, that is why Christians are the stronger, uh, the strongest mercy, compassion, and missions for forces in the world. That's why we give to people around the world because they're created in God's image and no matter what the color of their skin, they can be in Haiti or in Bangladesh, they are precious to our God. He's the creator. <laughs> Elohim is preeminent. He transcends, he transcends creation and he transcends time. He's preeminent over time. In the beginning, God, don't miss this. Another reason why he introduces himself as Elohim is to remind us that he's set, he set apart. God is set apart from the limitations and constraints of time. God created the beginning. God created, and, and, and if God created time, God preceded time. Because he could not have created something that already existed. Now please understand this. He transcends time. When you and I discuss and consider the concept of time, we do it in a chrono chronological or linear way. And we must not, cannot reduce God. Elohim, the, uh, the God of the beginnings. We cannot reduce God to our limited understanding because God exists outside of time. It is called in theological circles the preeminence, the transcendence, the pre-existence of God. 
The only thing we have uh, that is outside of time in our, in our comprehension is eternity itself. So God is not limited by time. But for God lives in eternity. He transcends his creation. For we, we contend we are affected. We're limited by the constraint of time. But God is time. Uh, the scripture always referred to God in the present in, in the Bible. Always refer to him in the present. Because you see, we have, we have yesterdays and tomorrow. But God doesn't have a yesterday. God doesn't have a tomorrow. God is always the now God. He is always the ever-present God. Say yes, please. He's the right now present God. When we get to heaven in our resurrected bodies and glorified bodies, we will also transcend the limitations and deterioration caused by times in our natural bodies. Don't look at anybody when I talk about deterioration. Don't look at anyone. <laughs> he transcends times. In heaven, we will experience what is to be, what it is like to be with Elohim, the ever right now God. We will experience what it is to have no aging, no sorrow, no loss, no deterioration, and, and everything in him will be in the now. Whether they are simultaneous or billions apart, we will live with him in the now. And I hear somebody in fourth row, seat number seven, say, okay, what does that have to do with me? What does that theology have to do with me? I'll tell you what it has to do with you. God is the right now God. It means he's never late. God is never too late. God never runs out of time. I ran out of time. Right. God is never behind schedule. God never forgets a time. He never forgets a me. He never forgets a, 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 a promise to you. Uh, God is never late. God is never, Elohim never, never says, uh, he never longs for the past, all oh, the good old days. He never says maybe in the future. He never says I, I'm out of time. He never wastes time. You say, I don't know what's happening. It seems like nothing is happening during this longest time in my life. What are you doing, God? He is doing something in you. He's doing a work in you. He never wastes time. Certain battles on the earth. Now, now what, what does that have to do with me? With God who is Elohim, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It, it, if you have this revelation, it brings you a heart to confidence and to trust and to faith. He's beginning, he's the end, the first and last page of my life. He's Alpha and Omega. He will do all things well in his time. Time. Now, in our, some certain battles on this earth seem to last a long time. But God, Elohim, all power and preeminence over the time gives to our victories eternal transcendence. In other words, when you hold on to God through the hard times, you will bring, God will give you victories in people's lives that will transcend times and have eternal value in their lives. And I spoke this last week at our church, one of our dear, dear couple of our church, Mark, Mark and Diane, he uh, just a few months ago, at, six, at age 68, was diagnosed with, with a horrible terminal cancer. And he just, he literally had a matter of, of weeks. And when, when they told him in the hospital, he came straight to the church, came straight to our office. I closed the door of my office and we prayed with him. And it was amazing because he was in faith. He said, I'm a, I am ready. I, I, I want to glorify God with every day, last day of my life. I'm in peace. I want my life to speak. It. I, I have been with millionaires that were uh, getting close to death, full of terror and fear. He was so filled with peace, so filled with, with confidence in God. And I went to visit him a week ago. He passed just two days ago. We do the funeral next week. I went to see him in the hospital just a, a, a week ago. And, and he was telling me, I didn't realize this. He told me, he says, you know, he says, Pastor Claude, it's incredible that you're here uh, in my room. He says, for 12 years, my wife came to Christ and I was so against it. He's a former surgeon, uh, um, uh, he's a former detective. And, and he was doing uh, uh, all kinds of investigation and he was so hardened and he had been abused by uh, priests when he was a child so he hated everything to do with Christ and church and for 12 years she prayed she she and he was telling me I didn't know all this he said Pastor Claude it's amazing you're in my room here he says you don't know all the things I said about you <laughs> I said don't tell me Mark don't tell me I don't need to know 
And he says, for 12 years, he says, I would come in, I would hide in that big church, uh, 2,500 uh, in the first service. I would sit in the back, and he'd start talking. It says, if you'd point your finger right at my heart, and I'd tell my wife, you've been talking to me, uh, about me to your pastor. And he says, sometimes I walked out. He says, one time I forgot that we came in the same car. I walked out, I stormed out of the church. I have nowhere to go. I don't have a car. But he came to Christ. He came. You see his wife. His wife persevered. His wife through time believed in Elohim who's an ever-present God. And she, her prayers brought this man to faith. And his faith, he's walking in faith and, he, and he's gone. Now you say he died. And he, no, no, his body has stopped. But he's ever now present with the ever now present God. Say yes, please. How would be your name? He's, he's Elohim, the preeminent, transcends creation, transcends time. He's preeminent and transcends space. He created the heavens and the earth. Heavens and the earth, it's a merism. They call it an, a merism theology, a combination of two words to, uh, uh, de, uh, to de describe and define an entire entity. Uh, we have this in biblical poetry. They'll say from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Uh, it's, a, it's a merism. Before God created mankind, when he speaks of heavens and the earth, before God created mankind, God created a location, a space in which mankind would exist. You and I know and experience only the heavens and the earth. We don't comprehend anything beyond the heavens and the earth because we exist in that space. Yet God existed when that space was not. He was and is preeminent. He transcends not only creation and time, but he also transcends. He's preeminent over space and over matter. Everything we see is tied to matter. Matter is the substance of everything material. Uh, matter reflects the physical components of everything in the universe. But God transcends that. In order for God to be outside of time and space and matter, he must exist in another dimension. That is not diminished or limited by time, space, matter like we are. God operates in a totally another realm, which is precisely why you and I should never limit God to our comprehension, to our measure, to what we see, to what we hear, to what we feel, to what we taste, to what we smell. They, God is doing things in your life. God has everything in control, and he's doing things in the invisible that you cannot fathom. My thoughts are above your thoughts. My wisdom is above above your wisdom says the Lord the weapons of our warfare are not carnal there's a we call on to an invisible God who transcends everything we see and in this invisible world uh, in this invisible world no weapon formed against us shall prosper and God is in control there's a lot more than what you see because not only is he preeminent but Elohim is ever present He's present. He's passionate in proximity. It, that's his omnipresence. He's there. He's there for you. He's here. He's ever. He's a ever present. A Jeremiah 23. He's not limited by space. There's no distance. There's no absence with God. Jeremiah 23, 23, 24. Am I a God near at hand? Am I, uh, says the Lord, am I not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see them? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, says the Lord. The theological term is he is preeminent, is transcendent, but he's everywhere. He's, he, he is imminent. He is omnipresent in a very real realm of our lives every day. Psalm 139. I ask you to look at Psalm 139 if you have it. Psalm 139 in verse 5. You have surrounded me, you've hedged me behind me and in front of me, before me, but you lay your hand upon me. Verse 7, when I go, where, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If, he, if I say, surely darkness will hide me before the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night, even the night will shine as day. He is not only preeminent, he's ever present and passionate in proximity. The psalmist says, if I ascend into the heavens, if I make my bed into hell, behold, you are present. You are there. But not only present in a very general, global, or even uh, or e e even uh, distance. So no, he says, you're, you're present. You're there wherever I go, you're there. But your hand is upon me. 
that God is ever present, creator of all things, with his hand on you, actually not only uh, leading me, but actually he says, you're, there are seasons in my life where I don't see or feel anything, but your hand is holding me. How many of you, you can testify that in some season when you were walking in the valley of the shadow of death, he was holding you until the other, until the other side. Elohim is ever present. Even when I say, I, I, I'm too far. I'm, he goes to the, ho, to the low and to the height. He goes to the east and the west. He says, he says, with me, with God. The psalmist says, with my God, I can never say I'm too far gone. My child is too far gone. He's too away. I've drifted too far away. I feel him far away. No, he's there. He's ever present. He even says, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me. No. There's no darkness with God. There's no secret. There's no notion with God of this is public, this is private, secret, hidden. So this produces two things in us. If you understand your God, hallowed be his name. If you understand your God and you, it will produce faith in the Lord. There's nothing that, there's nowhere I can be in my life. There's no geographical. doesn't matter what neighborhood you come from. doesn't matter what country you come from. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, we use this, I'm, I'm in a bad space in my life. doesn't matter where you are, what space you're in. No matter what place you are in your life, he is there. He's there with you, never leaving you. His hand holding you, lifting you up. It produces faith in the Lord, and it should produce the fear of the Lord. You can't, he says, even when I, when I think I'm covered with, darkness is covering me, I'm okay, people don't see this. No, God is there. He's there over your computer, he's there when you leave the church, he's there in your relationships outside the church, he's there in your heart, he's there if you keep bitterness, he's there if you lie, he's there if you cheat. It got quiet, I'm going to amen myself for a while. <laughs> he's there, no, it should produce that, not, 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 not a fear and sense of condemnation, but a holy sense of fear of the Lord. Lord, I'm carrying your name and you, I can never hide from you. I can never, everything, my heart is before you, but it's also an incredible comfort when people accuse you wrongly, when people misjudge you, when people are unjust, uh, uh, persecute you, when people uh, uh, come against you with things and you say that, that's not true. God knows the truth. He will be your judge. He will be your justice. Say yes, please. Even, even when I don't see God, even when I'm, I don't see any possible light, God says, I am light, I am here. A week, uh, last week and in the last few weeks, I, last week when I spoke this, I shared some testimonies that we brought our people uh, and shared. Uh, I, I called it, a, it's, it was a, a God is always here testimony time. No matter where they were in that place, he transcends space and time and creation. He's, he, he's, he's preeminent. He's everywhere. And, and now we had one testimony after the other. We had a, 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 this testimony of this, uh, 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 the, this young girl who for years was, was, was struggling and was losing uh, before she knew the Lord to anorexia and bulimia. And she, she told a story of being alone in her room. She, was, uh, she came back from the doctor. She was for the first time under 90 pounds. She was killing herself with this disease, this mental and psychological disease. And, and she began to call on God. She says, in that room, in my room alone, looking my, at myself, I began to call on God to free me. She joined, she came to the church, she accepted the Lord. She, gave, she joined a group of young ladies who have come out of this. And here she was two years later uh, at her baptism testifying of being completely free from, uh, uh, from that, uh, that, bond, that bondage. God was there in that room. God was there for those parents at four in the morning in a kitchen, wringing their hands in terror and fear, their hearts sick with their son who's uh, using and, and he's dependent and, and he's uh, on cocaine and crack and, and, and they, they don't know where he is and they grab their hands over the kitchen table. God was there. God was there. God, God is there ever present. And, and two Wednesday nights ago, uh, during the prayer meeting, she, they were standing with their son, two years sober, uh, standing beside them. God was there. God was there for that young man. That young, uh, young married man, uh, young father who, who came back from work, uh, was coming back with his, uh, his, his wife in the car, and she said, I don't love you anymore. It's over. And when she uh, walked out of the car, he says, he put his face on the steering wheel. Thank God, my whole world is exploding. But God was there in the car, hearing his cry, hearing his prayer, and his patience, and his, his perseverance in, in speaking love uh, to his wife. And at a, at a couple's conference we had two months ago, she she tore up any divorce paper and they're holding hand together in the presence of God. God was there. I'm talking about Elohim. 
The preeminent God, he transcends time and space and he comes where you are. He, he, he was there in that doctor's office. We had the two couples, two parents uh, come up with their son and their daughter with Matsis and Victoria, both of them in the same uh, period of time. They were there. God was there when the doctor said the dreaded words, leukemia. And he was there through a treatment and he was there through uh, the prayer and when the heart stopped and they revived. But God would also, was also there when the doctor said in both cases, remission, complete remission, both child are cancer free. I want you to give praise to God. God is there. Can you give him praise? He's the ever present, ever passionate in proximity. Elohim is preeminent. He transcends his creation. He transcends time and space. And the Elohim is ever present, passion and proximity. And Elohim is powerful in creation and redemption. When God, from the outset, God wants us to understand him and his power. Elohim means literally in Hebrew, the strong one. It has to do with a sovereignty and the authority of God reflecting the infinite, infinite measure, limitless power of our God. That's how he presents himself. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. He's the all-powerful creator. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. But the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Elohim is defined as the creator. The term created is only used in scripture for God. It's never used in the biblical mindset. It's never used uh, for men or for women. Because man does not create like God creates. Man can, uh, can reconfigure things. He can recalibrate things. Uh, he can uh, uh, reform things. Man does not create from nothing. Only God has the creative capacity to create from nothing. Ex nihilo. And he, the, the earth was without form. It was void. It was, only, uh, it was formless. It was ex nihilo, without form, from nothing, from darkness. In the poetic language of scripture in the Psalms or in Job, for example, it, it reminds us of all creation shouts this out. Job 12, 7 to 9. But now ask all creation. It will teach you and the heavens and the earth, the birds of the air, the fish of the seas and created things and they will explain it to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has created all things? In whose hand is the life, breath and soul of all mankind? Elohim is ever-present, passionate in proximity. That is why God is very, is very prompt and confronting when people that walk with him and men and women walking with him in scripture doubt his power. That's why he confronted Abraham when, when he gave him the promise and Abraham said, too late, too old, impossible. And God says, is there anything too hard for God? I'm Elohim, the creator, that just with my, my finger, says the psalm, uh, psalm 8, from my finger, from ex nihilo, I created all this. That's why he told Mary, is there, when she said, no, it's not possible. Is there anything impossible for God? He is the, all he's the creator. He's the uh, powerful Elohim, the powerful uh, creator in creation and in, and in redemption. Understand, Elohim, the creator, does not need the material or visible elements that we consider necessary. He's beyond logic and, and tangible uh, to accomplish his purposes. All he needs is himself. And all we need is faith in him. So when you come to a place and you say, I, I would need to see something. I see nothing happening in my son's life. I see nothing. I don't have the elements. I would need to see something happening. I see no change. I see no direction. I see no, I, I don't see, I don't, I would, not, I would need to have the necessary elements. All you, all God, all God need is himself. And all you need is faith in him. He can create love when there was no love. He can create a peaceful family when all you had was ex nihilo, void and strife and darkness. He can create a future when all you had is a horrible past. He can create a heart of flesh where all you see is a heart of stone. Some of you should be shouting right now because I'm telling your story. I'm telling your testimony. He created... He created me out of nothing. There was nothing there. But he breathed into me and gave me life. He can create 
He can create a church that touches the world, 51st and Broadway, when there was nothing. There was nothing. And now prayers go here to the whole world. He's God. He's the ever-present, all-powerful creator. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, Hebrews 11, 3, so that the things which are not seen were not made of things which are visible. Evolution teaches uh, what Fra Francis Collin, Francis Collin is a Nobel Peace Prize Christian astrophysician, and he calls this the insane equation, the, the senseless, the insane equation, because portions of the, uh, of the evol evolution theory goes like this. Nobody plus nothing equals everything. But watches have, have watchmaker, and paintings have painters, and designs have designers, and creations have a creator. He's a creator of all things from ex nihilo. When, uh, when uh, in 1997, when the Hubble telescope took flight, it gave us a look into, uh, through its powerful lenses, into places we'd never seen before. We discovered a staggering numbers of galaxies beyond our own. Our tiny Earth is just one puny little star, little planet, uh, just puny uh, in one puny galaxy. And our, our Milky Way galaxy is just a small disk shaped spiral. In fact, scientists now believe that each of the 200 billion galaxies they have discovered as have up to 100 billion stars in each of them. Now, if this is giving you a headache, if this is too large for you, I see some of you are going like this, I don't know anymore. Uh, <laughs> If this is too large for you, just consider one. Just consider one. They, they consider one galaxy they, they name, uh, name in Adromedia, uh, Adromeda uh, is roughly 2.5 million light years away. Light years travel about 186 miles per second, which is about the speed that I speak. Uh, wanna... <laughs> so if you have, no, no, think of this, 2.5 million light years. So if you have a friend living in Andromeda and you send him a message, at the speed of a radio wave, which, is, which travel the speed of light, you could receive their reply back in about five million years. <laughs> now recently there was a funeral of the, of the famous scientist, astrophysician, and, and author Stephen Hawkins. He died in March at the age of 76. And they sent a message into space with a synthesized track of his voice to the nearest black hole. They actually have a name for it. It's 1A0620-00. Take that and note. That's going to be on the exam. Uh, one. <laughs> Located at 3,500 light years from this earth. He will, the message should get there in five to 600 years. But when you send a message to Elohim, he answers you right now. He answers you now. He created all this. He created all this and he can create what needs to happen in you, your life, your family, your home, your future, your children, your marriage, because he's the all-powerful creator. Shout yes, please. Now why? Why is it so important to God? Why must we never forget he is Elohim, God, infinitely powerful in creation and redemption? Before God, notice this in Genesis, we look, that's the first name of God. Before God reveals and demonstrates his kindness, his patience, his tender heart, his loving kindness, his long suffering, his name is mercy and amazing grace and amazing love and the, uh, the matchless and unimaginable patience and kindness and mercy of God. He wants us to know him as before that, as the almighty creator who knows all things, sees all things, is capable of all things, is infinitely close to us, but infinitely powerful to create from ex nihilo. Why does he want us to hallow, to elevate, to consider his name, to be hallowing, powerful, creator of all things in creation and redemption? Why is it so important? This is my last thought. Because Elohim, the preeminent, is at the ever-present God is also Elohim, the personal God. Elo his name is Elohim, but Elohim is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us in Christ. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the, the earth was without form and vo void. Tohu wabohu, complete emptiness. Darkness was upon the face of the earth, but the Spirit of God was moving 
upon the darkness and the emptiness and the tohu wabohu and the void, the Spirit of God was moving. Elohim is not only preeminent and present and passion, proximity, and powerful. Elohim is personal and Elohim is plural. In the beginning, God the Father said, let us make men According to our, uh, Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make men in our image, according to our likeness. Father, Spirit, and Son uh, was there over the, over the void, over what was the, the emptiness. Elohim, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, still moving to create. And, and notice, not to create partially, Genesis 1, 26, let us make men in our image, according to our likeness. In Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he will be a new creation. All things, all to old tohu abohu, confusion, uh, the, the darkness, the void, the emptiness, everything uh, out of order, out of beauty, out of sequence. There is nothing left. There's nothing there. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, the creator Elohim is Emmanuel. I'll make you a new creation and all things can become new. Do you not have the understanding that most of Christendom has set the bar has set the bar of Christianity so much lower than God. God's purposes for us is not that we would be saved not to go to hell, but pretty much continue to be the same people we were. Lie a little, cheat a little, same character, same thing. No, no, he wants to transform us in his image, that the likeness of God would be found in me. That is character, that is love, that is patience, that, that is truth, that is love, that is long-suffering, that who he is would be reflected in me, that little Christ would live, that his name would be hallowed in, him, in me and through me. Say yes, please. Now, now please understand this. Uh, the, the, the new creation, we, the new creation because Elohim came to us. The powerful creator is the all personal Christ. Elohim is Emmanuel. Do you not, do you, would you allow him, do we still, I've been walking with the Lord for 30, more and more than 35 years. Do I still, I was, I was being challenged by this message and uh, on the last few months, thinking, do I still allow God to move over the dry or the dark spaces in my life? Do I still allow him to continue creating who he is in me? Do I still allow him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together? That's why Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, uh, 21, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is, means God with us. Emmanuel embodies, Jesus embodies, and fulfills all of God's name and attributes. A child is born, says Isaiah, a son is given. This is because the son existed before the child was born. Jesus is pre-existing. Elohim came to us to create where everything was without form and void. Colossians says it this way, that Christ was there at creation. He is the image, uh, Colossians 1, 15 and 16, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, by Christ, uh, things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities, powers. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus did not make his debut in, in a manger on the first Christmas morning in Bethlehem. He existed and reigned before creation in the beginning. But Elohim became personal. He became Emmanuel. He, he, became, he was perfectly man, human. Tempted in all things that he would come to the rescue to succor all that are tempted. He was, he was flesh and bone. He was flesh, bone, and blood. He was, he was entirely human and perfectly God. Hello, he was, he was, he was, he was he, perfectly human. He was, he, he, Jesus walked among us. He was flesh, bones, and blood. And yet he was perfectly divine. At one moment he was hungry because he was fully human. The next moment he would feed 5,000 because he was God. At one moment, he would be thirsty because he was human. At the other moment, he would walk on water because he was completely God. In his childhood, as he grew, he, he, he was completely, because he was completely human, he could grow in knowledge and in stature. But because he was entirely God, he knew every heart and intent and thought of their secret hearts. 
Because he was human, he hung on a cross and they crucified him and he died. But because he was entirely divine, entirely God, he rose up from the grave, resurrected God, and the same spirit that raised him from the grave lives in me to create what he wants to create. You should shout, this is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Emmanuel is with us and the word became flesh and dwelled among us. John 1. And we, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the bosom, from the bosom of the Father, He has shown Him. He has unveiled Him. He has incarnated Him. He has declared Him. Hallowed be His name. He alone is the limitless, all powerful Creator. But He's my Emmanuel. So personal. My Savior who comes to me. I love, I'm going to ask the musicians to come and I close with this, these two testimonies. In the excellent bestseller, Finding Your Way, Christian book, Finding Your Way, there's the, there is the verified story that actually has been told many times, even in the Pentagon, of Seaman Elgin Staples and his mother. In August 9, 1942, Elgin Staples was 19 years old and he was a seaman during the war aboard uh, the USA Astoria. And they are attacked and the ship is sunk. He's lost at sea, he's drifting, and he's holding on to a flotation device, a belt, a flotation device. is holding on for dear lives. And he's finally, he's finally rescued from a very small rescue ship that sunk again. So while, while he's, he's holding on to his flotation device and his mother is praying, 8,000 miles away. His mom, his Christian mother, is praying for him because she, the only thing she heard is he was lost at sea. And while he was, while he was holding on to this thing, he had hours and hours, and this is saving his life. He's, 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 he's at sea, and he sees that this belt, this flotation device, is actually made in a factory in Akron, Ohio. And he's all, huh, this is where I'm from. This is my hometown, Akron, Ohio. <laughs> And he sees a number on it, a very clear serial number. And finally, they, pay, they, they come to rescue him. And he's holding on to this thing because he's been sunk twice now. So he's, uh, he's holding on to it. And when he gets home, he gets his medal. And they have pictures of this. I showed the pictures when I uh, shared this at our church. And, and, and when he came home to his mom, he, he told her the story. And he gets out the flotation device. He gets out the, the belt. And he says, look, mom, this was made here in Akron, Ohio. And she begins to weep. And she says, when the war started, I took this job. While you were away, I took a job at this factory in Akron, Ohio. And this number is my employee number. We each have a number. Do you understand? Do you understand that almighty God, the creator who controlled the oceans and the waves and the wind, is also the personal Emmanuel God with us who hears the prayer of a mother and they're going, oh, please shout out to God, he's your God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to close with this. He's Emmanuel. He's Elohim. He's all powerful creator, but he's also my personal Savior, Lord, God, his hand upon me in proximity. I have a group of men that pray for me, and this one brother, every time he prays for me, if I have any doubt, if I had a bad week, bad month, and an attack on all sides, our church has over 5,000 come every week, so it's, it's like a town, it's a village, so there's always 50 amazing stories and 50 battles. It's like a hospital. There's, a, there's people living, dying, sick, and, and all this. And so, so some weeks it's just, and they, they come and they lay hands uh, on me. Uh, and, and recently, I don't know if I, I, try to, I try to look like everything's okay, but recently he came. He says, who? He says, you need me to pray for you. I said, no, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. And he goes, and he, when he finished praying, he said, remember, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. I said, yeah, that's true, Bert. That's true. This means a lot to us, to, to this man and me. This means a lot to us because years ago, now it's 14 years ago, he was struck uh, with thyroid cancer that had spread. And he was a young father and, and, and uh, three children. He didn't know if he was going to survive to a point where they say, they said, call your notary, set your house in order. We, we're trying everything we can. But So I went to visit him in the hospital one day. Uh, I, I would go visit him and, and, and I stood there and the, and the nurse warned me. She said, we gave him, um, he's reacting. He has strong, very strong reaction to one medication we tried. It ma makes him so sick and he's freezing. He has high fever, but he's freezing and he had lost so much weight. He's over 6'2". He had lost so much weight and he, she said he's he, 
he's, he's in a bad state right now. So I walked in the room and they put all these blankets over him and this tall guy is shaking, his teeth shaking and he's just, and he's throwing up and, and, and I'm very careful in those moments not to, not to spit out cliches. Don't just say oh, made up, just, and I was just standing there and we were talking and then sometimes silence and just praying and was holding his hands and praying and, and then I'd be praying in the spirit and, and, and we're talking and I said, are you, are you, they gave you the, uh, you're getting the messages on the streaming and I said, yes. And he says, well, there's one thing he says, I, I miss, he says, I, I miss the worship because we only have the messages on streaming. We don't have the worship. And he says, I miss, he says, I miss it. He says, when you pick up the mic. And you, and you, at the end of the worship, and you lead the worship. He says, it's not because you're a good singer. I said, thank you. It's not because you're a good singer. But he says, it just, it's like I'm with my pastor, and we're all worshiping together. And he says, you bring us the place. He says, I miss that, you know. And this thought, this is not a voice audible, but this thought came into my spirit. Why don't you sing for him? You know. Yeah, well, you can clap, but I'm in a hospital room, and uh, <laughs> I understand, you know. Uh, I can clap. I'm in a hospital room. There's no mic. There's no stage. I'm just there. There's nurses running around. I'm like, okay, um, yeah. And before I say anything, I'm, I'm wrestling this thing. And before, uh, uh, you know, I'm too proud. So I'm, I'm, maybe I'll look foolish. And, 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 and before I can say anything, he says, why don't you sing for me? I'm like, okay. I said, uh, so, so it was strange because I'm standing there wanting to sing for him. But he's so sick. And, he's so, and, it, and this is not the usual hospital visit. But I just felt, I, I, it's like a brother, and he's, I felt such my heart for him. So I went into bed. I actually ended up lying in bed holding him. And then it hit me, what if a nurse walks by? She's going to think, this is the strangest pastoral visit in history. So we're singing. I'm singing songs in his ear, and he got, he, he got to like it. He's actually calling out special requests. He's like, sing this one and this one. He's a French guy, but he's bilingual, and he says, well, why don't we sing that, that old one? He says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Steadfast. If you know it, sing it with me. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faith. Fullness, oh God, great is thy faithfulness. In the month that followed, he came out of the hospi hospital. He's been in remission for 14 years completely, <laughs> cancer free. Because, because, I want us to sing, your, your name is so, uh, what, a, what a beautiful name. I want us to worship his name as we close. Because he is a Elohim. He's the almighty creator. But he's also the personal Emmanuel, God with us. So here's my, a few, few months ago I was watching the worship here and I heard your, the singers just singing, what a beautiful name. Actually singing Genesis 1. You were, you were there from the beginning. You were there in creation. You were there before creation. I'm going to ask the singers to help, to help us, and we're going to have a moment of worshiping his name. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. But before we do, I want to make this call because I feel this message is for so many of us. It's for all of us, really, to, to be renewed in the heart, to hollow, to elevate, to worship, to, to honor his name and not live it, speak it, represented in vain but I also feel it is for some some many of us it is more than that it's a moment in time that this date this date of July 2018 is a moment God got an appointment with you this morning right here it's a divine meeting because the enemy had come in like a flood but today God has spoken truth to your heart and life and he wants you to bring, bring everything to him. So I'm going to ask you please to, to stand with me. Give me a minute. Please don't rush off. Give it, yeah, allow yourself a minute. Would you stand with me? And if you're here this morning, and this is the early this morning as I was praying, this is the call that was on my heart. So just, just respond. If this is you, 
Don't even hesitate one second. Get, step out of your seat and come and bring it to God. You hear? I felt uh, someone say, I, I have been in exile from God. Maybe I'm in church every week, but I was in exile. Like you said at the beginning, I was, I was in exile from God. I felt it was so far away. I thought I was, I was too far. I, I did, there was things I, I was seeing, these things I did not see. I see nothing. I understand nothing. I feel nothing. But this morning I come to him. He's my God. He's Emmanuel. And I come and I bring everything to him. I want you to come from all over, all over the sanctuary in Maine. Even the balcony will wait for you. This is important. You hear this morning and you say you're in a battle and you say it's been, it had been so long. So much time had passed in this battle. I prayed and wept and fought and clawed and, and felt almost to, to let it go, to give up. But this morning God spoke to me. He transcends time. So this long battle, I'm holding it and I'm bringing it to God this morning. I want you to come. This long battle for a son or for a daughter. This battle in your life. This battle that is secret or that is public. This battle that all in you. You said you were saying it's been so much time, but God says, as you hold on to me, I will give you victories that will transcend time. I will redeem the time. And I will give you back, restore what time and the enemy has stolen away. So you come and you bring it to God this morning. I have been through a season where I did not feel he was here. I did not, I didn't see anything anymore. I didn't feel like I had the elements to, to believe. I didn't think, I didn't see any progress. I didn't see anything developing. I didn't see anything changing. But this morning, the Word of God came to my heart. He creates from ex nihilo. He creates from nothing. So this might sound strange, but for some of you, it's going to be exactly what you've been thinking the last few weeks. You're going to come out of your seat and say, I'm bringing my nothing to you. I'm bringing what appears to be nothing, what seemed to be nothing. I want you to come. I'm bringing it to you this morning, oh God. Because you're the God who creates out of nothing. You're the God who comes to me. You're the God who you're my Emmanuel. You're God with us. You, well, well, I, I'm never too far. I'm never too deep. I'm never too far away. And you are with me. Your hand holds me. Hallelujah. God, we worship you. We worship you. Lift your hands to him. Just lift your hands as a sign of surrender to him. Just tell him, I worship you, Lord. I worship you above my problems. I worship you above my current situation. I lift your name high above every circumstance, above every difficulty, above every trial. I proclaim the name is Jesus, the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, Elohim, the ever-present, the ever-powerful, God who transcends time and space. God, I thank you that nothing can stay your hand. Nothing can limit you. You can do anything, anywhere, at any time you want. God, there is no power in hell. Lord, there is no disease. There is no sickness. Lord, there is no struggle. There is no battle. Lord, there is nothing, oh God, that can stop you. God, I praise you. I, I choose to worship you. I choose to focus on you and not my problems. I choose to focus on you and not my struggles. I choose to focus on you and nothing else. God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. You are good and you are the Savior of my soul. You are my forgiveness. You are my righteousness. You are my deliverance. You are my power. You are my everything. I worship you. I worship you, God. I praise you this morning. I praise you this morning. I praise you. I praise you, mighty God. I exalt you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I choose to lift up the matchless name of Jesus. For there is nobody like you, Lord. Hallelujah. I refuse to limit you, God. God, I thank you that the good work you've begun in us, you're going to finish it, Lord. You finish what you start, oh God. Hallelujah. I say God is good. The devil is a liar. My God reigns. Hallelujah.
And so, Lord, now we, we receive your peace that passes all understanding. We receive peace in our soul. We receive freedom from anxiety, freedom from fear. God, we just thank you for what you've done today. There's an expectancy in our hearts, Lord. God, we worship you. We praise you. In the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.